These first pieces were written when I was between 19 and 23, and they were called more, they're from a book called This Kind of Bird Flies Backward. They're, this little section was called More or Less Love Poems. And if you read about the 50s, you know that um, we were so busy being cool that we didn't know how to say the word love, among other things. So here's a love poem. For you, I would no longer pick my so pickable nose or bite my delicious nails. For you, I would fix my teeth and buy a mattress. For you, I would kill my favorite roach that lives in the woodwork by the drawing table. That was a love poem. <laughs> Another love poem from this, that period. You bet your life, next bedtime, I'll get even. I'll call your name wrong. And you'll think it happened accidental. I was a very nice little 18 year old woman to, to be friends with. You know, I mean, I'm not going to go far in that because I want to get on. But this one written around that time was for my first baby. I wanted a child. I was, it was 56, 1956. I didn't want a man. I asked various of my lovers, and they were horrified. So I stopped asking. <laughs> And this was, I was, I guess I was uh, five, about maybe five or six months pregnant when I wrote this for my first daughter, who's now 50, actually. And it's called Song for Baby O, Unborn. Sweetheart, when you break through, you'll find a poet here, not quite what one would choose. I won't promise you'll never go hungry or that you won't be sad on this gutted, breaking globe. But I can show you, baby, enough to love, to break your heart forever. I still get letters from young women about that poem. Like about many of those early ones, actually. So moving on, in the 60s, I became more interested in what was going on the, in my, in the, within my head, the stretching out of the line, the following everything instead of cutting it down to the most sparse. And I think at that point, I stopped so much being whatever the beat was. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it is. There's a beat that is just um, the sense of pushing at the edges of consciousness all the time. And I guess one never gets past that if one's a poet of certain kinds. There's a beat that's more down home, down home and dirty, writing the language of the streets, which is inter interesting, but it isn't my whole path. Or my, um, Ginsburg would say, only what's before your eyes, only write about what you can see. But that's not me either. So that beat is what, I don't know. Anyway, here's a love poem from the early 60s from a book called The New Handbook of Heaven, which I wrote for Leroy Jones, who I had a child with, Amiri Baraka. The Beach. Where I ship out from, the tides give no indication. Washing dead flowers under the rocks at my back, the houses flat and implacable, painted green. It peels. The walls are damp. The chill at the railroad station in the mornings, always the dawn, light, and wind, our collars turned up. The suitcases broken, a gesture, almost empty. Ourselves, the pitiful gray of no baths, no sleep, the gray we rub off the sheets in the green houses. Did we lock the door? The sea is gold in the dawn light, the rocks silhouetted against it. How many years will you amble along the shore, hands in your pockets, whistling the same old tune, living on soft-shell crabs, the sea floor hard 
under your clean, bare feet. Just as I caught the train, I think I saw you shuffling to the horizon to stamp it flat. That was before the picnic basket fell open. And my choice, my monster lobster, walked back home. <laughs> Much stuff happened in the 60s, and in the early poems of the 60s and the later poems. At some point, I began to write um, what became the revolutionary letters. Um, what happened was, Somebody, had, somebody in New York hired a flatbed truck, Sam Abrams, a poet, and uh, a generator that would run an amplifier. And we went out, some folk singers who were considered very radical, and guerrilla theater people who did street theater, and poets, and we went all over New York. This was those years of assassinations around 67, 68, and so on. Not the first ones, the second wave of assassinations. And we would just perform places. And I realized the poems I had mostly were too intellectual for that kind of performing. So I started to write things that were more something you could hear on one hearing on the street, something more like guerrilla theater, even though it was poetry. And uh, they became the revolutionary letters. And I'm still writing them, as I said. And I'm looking for their book right now that just came out with recent ones, but um, while I'm looking for it, I'm, I think I want to, OK, here it is. Um, the early ones, I mean all of them, but the early ones were clearly just a, just a one-time punch, and that was it. Um, people could hear them and would do, do whatever they wanted with it. I'm anarchist. My grandfather on my mother's side was an anarchist who wrote with Carlo Tresca for his newspaper. And I tended to have that way with my politics. I never joined anything, but I wrote lots and put it out there for to be used. However, and um, I'm looking for one that particularly works for this kind of thing. But if I don't find it, I'll give you another one quickly. Here's one that'll do. It was an early one. This was, we're talking now, I started those in New York with the flatbed truck, but by 68, I was on the West Coast working with the diggers, delivering free food, and uh, reading on the steps of City Hall at noon every day to persuade people to drop out of their jobs, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. I would read these with Coyote, Peter Coyote would play music, and other people were doing things with masks and whatever. So this is around 69. Can you own land? Can you own house? Own rights to others' labor, stocks or factories? Or money loaned at interest? What about the yield of same? Crops, autos, airplanes dropping bombs? Can you own real estate so others pay you rent? To whom does the water belong? To whom will the air belong as it gets rarer? The American Indians say that a man can own no more than he can carry away on his horse. So there were a lot of those. They would go out to something called the Liberation News Service, which would send them to 200 revolutionary ma uh, news, uh, underground papers all over the country. And uh, people would print what they wanted. And this went on every week or so. And Eventually, I put out a book of them in 1970 with City Lights. And each time there was a new book, um, I added the new ones. So I'm going to read one more. It has, of course, the language of the day. So man is innocent and beautiful instead of humans. But you know, also, there's a rhythm you have to worry about, too. So this is, who is the we? Who is the they in this thing? Did we or they kill the Indians, not me? My people brought here cheap labor to exploit a continent for them. Did we or they exploit it? Do you admit complicity, say, we have to get out of Vietnam? We have to get out of Iraq? We really should stop poisoning the water, etc. Look closer. Look again. 
secede, declare your independence, don't accept a share of the guilt they want to lay on us. Man is innocent and beautiful and born to perfect bliss they envy. Heavy deeds make heavy hearts, and to them life is suffering. Stand clear. So there were a lot of those, and they were written for a long time. They're still being written. And rather than try to go back toward the end, I'll read you some. This edition just came out in last, last fall, Last Gas Press, and has 23 poems that weren't, able to be, that weren't in the last edition. Each time we would add the new ones, as I said. I'll read a couple of these. Some are long, and I'm going to read a couple of short New Wish ones. February 14th, 2001. So this was pre-9-11, but February 14th, 2001. Someone put out a flag for Valentine's Day as if the domain of the heart could belong to this heartbroken nation. And this one is called Les Americains. We are feral. I was watching at that point, it was, 19, it was October of 2001. I was on the road and I was watching uh, basic television, which was all I had in my cheap room at the, somewhere in New Jersey. And um, I was watching these people escaping or trying to escape from Afghanistan just before the bombing started. Their faces, that was all we saw. Les American. We are feral, rare as mountain wolves. Our hearts are pure and stupid. We go down, pitted against our own. Another one, brief one. I, there are nice longer ones, but I want to go on. Called Ancient History. The women are lying down in front of the bulldozers, sent to destroy the last of the olive groves. So skipping back a little, we got 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to go just, so then there were the 70s, and then there were the 80s. And I'm all through the 70s, I began to write Loba, which I didn't know what it was in 1971. Loba means a she-wolf. And I thought it was, this, first I thought it was this one-page poem. Then I thought it was this eight-page eight poem. Luckily, I was, there was this guy I was married to who was a poet, Grant Fisher, who said, I don't think that poem is finished, you might be on the lookout if it shows up again. And 30-something uh, years later, <laughs> books one and two add up to 300 and some pages only because Penguin wouldn't print the rest. And uh, there's a lot more. And the she-wolf is like women and, and myths of, of various animals and myths from various other things. But I wasn't interested ever in the myth for its own sake. It was only if it was something that had actually torn up my life or impinged on my life or been part of how I had to figure things out, then I would work the myth into the poem or the, or the myth would arrive. Love is something I can't make happen. It just arrives when it arrives. It first arrived when I was in the middle of teaching a class. Actually, I was in uh, Salinas with a, uh, a poet who spoke Spanish. We were working with the kids in the school from the, um, there was barbed wire all around the school and cops all over campus. They were the kids of the immigrant workers down there. And all of a sudden I heard these lines in my head and I, I sort of let Elias Ruski y Cortez take over the class. I just stepped back and started, because if you don't, when I hear lines in my head, if I don't write them down, I don't hear anything else until I write those lines down. So what was happening was this. I'll just read the very beginning. If he did not come apart in her hands, he fell like flint on her ribs. There was no middle way. 
The rocks screamed in the flowing water, stars dizzy with pain. If he was not daisies in her soup, he was another nettle in her hair. She stumbled crazy over the stony path between slanderous trees. Even field mice knew she called the shots. Dimensions of the obsidian cross he hung on, singing in the sun, her eyes cloudy with nightmare. She grinned, baring her wolf's teeth. So then you go back and you give another exercise and you talk and this thing keeps going on and it went on about eight little early parts that day. And then the last of those, that particular session was a repeat of the first. It was, if you, do, if you do not come apart like bread in her hands, she falls like flint on your heart. The flesh knows better than the spirit what the soul has eyes for. Has she sunk root in your watering place? Does she look with her wolf's eyes out of your head? And that was part of part one. Part one ended with a poem that was kind of Shiva-like, when Shiva dances and the universe disperses. I won't read all of it, but I'll read the beginning. The Loba dances. She raises in flames the city. It glows about her. The Loba, mother wolf and mistress of many, dances. She treads in the severed heads that grow like mosses on the flood. The city melts. It flows past her treading white feet and ends something like the loba dances, she treads the salty earth, she does not raise breath cloud heavenward, her breath itself is carnage. At that point I thought loba was done, but it turned out I was wrong. It turned out I was this much wrong, plus whatever's here and, and whatever's in the outtakes and all the rest of it. But it went through many stages, and I don't have very much time, so I'm going to go here and there. This is from the one of the ne or next, but still early parts. It is still news to her that passion could steer her wrong. Though she went down a thousand times, strung out across railroad tracks, off bridges, under cars, or stiff glass bottles still in hand, hair soft on greasy pillow, still it is news she cannot follow love, his burning footsteps in blue crystal snow, and still come out all right. Another one from that section. She strides in blue jeans to the corner bar. She dances with the old women. The men light up, they order wine. Hair sawdust is flying under her feet. Her sneakers thudding soft. Her wispy hair falls sometimes into her face. Were it not for the ring of fur around her ankles, just over her bobby socks, you'd never know. I'm sorry, there's no one would ever guess her name. And then it goes on and it go, enters into myth at some point. And at some point in the entering into myth, various myths come up that, as I said, were they really felt like they had to have shaken or owned me at some point. And then I was also doing exercises in the schools with the kids. I was on the road for the NEA from 71 to 78, all over the country. They didn't know how to find poets in Wyoming, so they would import them from the West Coast or the East Coast, <laughs> like cheese, you know. <laughs> so I was imported into Wyoming, into Montana, I worked a lot on the Indian reservations in Arizona. Um, after a while, they found out that there were people there writing poems, but <laughs> it took them about eight years. Um, and I learned a lot about the middle of the country. Anyway, this is an exercise, I think it was a Kenneth Koch exercise that I turned into. 
some lies about the loba. That she is eternal, that she sings, that she is starborn, that she gathers crystal, that she can be confused with Isis, that she is the goal, that she knows her name, that she swims in the purple sky, that her fingers are pale and strong, that she is black, that she is white, that you always know who she is when she appears, that she strides on battlements, that she sifts like stones in the sea, that you can hear her approach, that her jeweled feet tread any particular measure, that there is anything about her which can be said, that she relishes tombstones, falls down marble stairs, that she is ground only, that she is not ground, that you can remember the first time you met, that she is always with you, that she can be seen without grace, that there is anything to say of her which is not truth. There's a section that is uh, adaptations of poems, hymns by Ram Prasad, to, uh, hymns to Kali, um, that I had worked on years before and finished for a section of Loba. I'm making a section now that's it's going to be longish monologues by each of the early, uh, very early Japanese women writers. We seem to tend to think of them each as alike, but their vocabulary they're seeing is each different. Their work is so small, each poem. I'm, make, I'm making somehow, I hope, some longer monologues. I'm hoping to go visit some places in Japan before I do that, but my body doesn't like to move, so we'll see. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to read one of the Kali ones. So she, this is Kali, hymns to Kali, but it's also hymns to Tara, who Ram Prasad. Actually, I found these because Ramakrishna was very popular in the 60s, and he was very much a devotee of Ram Prasad, whose hymns are still sung in India, I understand. I'm going to read the last one. Ram Prasad is complaining at his bhakti religion, your, your, it, the, the deity is everything. Your, your lover, your child, your mother, your father, your everything. And you can also yell at them and complain them and all them. that. I'll read the last two. The six systems of philosophy do not grasp her. She drinks devotion. She abides in bliss. At dawn, she waits in your most secret chamber. Yogini lost in the ecstasy of love. She draws the lover as the lodestone iron. And the last one, his complaint in this batch anyway. The day will pass, this day will pass, only our story will remain. And generations of men will know your unkindness, Tara. I have come to the world market, I have shopped. I wait at the landing, the sun is setting. Mother, take me into the boat. The businessman, the boatman fills his ship with the rich. I am left behind. He asks for his fare, but I have no money. Oh, stony-hearted woman, pay my way. The boat has left. The sun is going down. I begin to swim in the ocean, chanting your name. Well, I believe we are out of time. We have, if we stretched it, we have five minutes. Do we want that five minutes or should we? St okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I have two things I want to do. I don't think I can do them both. Oh, I hate this. I hate this part of life. We have to make choices. Okay, I'm going to read one poem from the New Lova stuff. And... This is book, part of book three. There's more to book two than fit in there because they said 285 pages. I got away with 335, but there's more, <laughs> there's more book two in my computer. And this is the beginning of book three. And this poem is called Babylon to R.D. R.D. is Robert Duncan. 
and it starts with a quote from him. Fathered in the light and heat of one's son. And I want to say that we used to argue he could not conceive of light without warmth. And for me, I could conceive of both a cold light and et cetera. Anyway, and there's some grail references in here, but you'll get them or not. Babylon to R.D., fathered in the light and heat of one sun, and its necessary coldness, fat of the earth, water and earth of fire. In that light, wrapping my visible form as in a shawl, knit out of darkness by a mad ant, and so wrapped wielding the candelabra the knight in the old story holds in his left hand after he dreams he stole it from a chapel himself on the bier so wrapped in cold light as in a rich shawl wielding the candlestick crossed over from the dream I even I self upon self Am she, old father, see, I am the woman who stands in the black sun. There's a, a ton of more loba. And then there's a book that I wrote all in one night called Time Bomb, a couple of weeks after Katrina, which I won't get to, I don't think. And then there's... Another book I'm typing up called The Black Notebook. I take these little spiral notebooks with me when I go to hear jazz or other music, and they fill up with poems, because I can write in the dark, <laughs> thanks to my mother who turned the light out <laughs> <laughs> every night. I'll just read a couple of these. There are millions of them. Break camp or leave it as it is for whoever comes this way. This Philip, Philip Whalen's memorial. Phil had the best painkillers, <laughs> fried chicken and wine. There's tryptophan in chicken. This is the last I'll read. The crystal, he held it, never stops reflecting, doesn't get tired. He turned it, caught the light, replaced it in a bowl of rice. His hands trembled slightly. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Thank you.